Hello, bonjour, Annie. I'm Dr. Olathe McIntyre, and this is a Blue Coat Talk. Our guest today is a planetary scientist who is now the executive director of the Canadian Association of Science Centers, Dr. Marianne Mader. She also co-founded a not-for-profit organization called STEAM Labs, which is dedicated to education and innovation. Marianne has helped plan and execute several simulated lunar and planetary exploration missions, studied some of the oldest rocks on Earth in Greenland, and collected meteorites in Antarctica. Today, Marianne is going to share her Antarctica experience with us. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to speak with everyone today. <laughs> well, I have so many questions for you, um, but of course, those who are joining us live can also join the conversation using the comments, and you can include your name and age if you want to. We do encourage uh, participation from viewers of all ages. So to start off with, Marianne, how did you find yourself in Antarctica hunting meteorites? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And uh, I just want to let everyone know, uh, Alisa did send me some questions ahead of time. So I actually kind of went through all of my old photos uh, from this time that I was in Antarctica, and um, I have some of them to show. So I think as we go through, I can kind of flip back and forth and show some of those photos, if that's okay. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So um, to start with, as these kind of uh, slides come up, um, I have a background as a remote field scientist. Um, so I, all of my academic training at a master's and PhD was in, in field geology. And I did a lot of work in the Canadian high Arctic and in Greenland. And so this little image that I'm showing now just shows stars of kind of the different locations I had gone to. And I got that bug at some point after I'd been pretty high in the Canadian Arctic of, you know, like, I wanna go to Antarctica. <laughs> How do I get there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, and uh, just as a oops. um, I'll, I'll get the slide switching, but um, I I was thinking about how I could get there, and uh, it was really there's there's not a, a lot of ways as a research scientist to, to to get to Antarctica unless you build programs, and I found about this out about a program that was essentially. Um, uh, it's meteorite hunting in Antarctica. Okay, so I'm just going to give you this is the name of that program. It's the acronym is ANSMET. Um, I couldn't help it. I had to throw in a, a little quiz at the bottom here about what does this Latin expression mean? You, you can put your answers in the Facebook chat. You get two seconds while I explain a little bit about ANSMET. But ANSMET is an, it is an American program funded by NASA, by their National Science Foundation, and it's been going on for over 35 years. So they've oh. been sending people to Antarctica every season to collect meteorites. And when I found out about it, I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna apply to go and, and hunt meteorites as part of that program. And because I had this remote field science background, um, I was eligible, essentially. Okay, are you ready for the answer? Olathe, any guesses? I, I don't, I don't know. Ah! <laughs> I didn't know. Harvest stars. So beautiful. Harvest stars. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like side reel star. Yeah. So yeah. Sidereal star. I can guess that part. <laughs> hey. And so just so you guys have some like overall context about how amazing this program is. Um, uh, overall on earth, there's about like 45,000 meteorites that have been collected from anywhere on earth and 30,000 of them have been found in Antarctica. Okay, maybe we'll dive deeper into that. Why think about that as we go through? Why, why is that? I'm sure that's one of the first questions. I'm not gonna tell you yet. <laughs> uh, and the cool thing about ANSMED is basically they, this program that's been going on over 35 years has found half of those meteorites. So it's been extremely successful. Wow. Yeah. So I think I'll leave it there for now. Okay. So, okay, so you, you wanted to go to Antarctica, um, you used your, your science in um, to sign up to a program, and, and as you, you, know, you found out you were accepted, which must have been very exciting, um, what, what were you most excited about, uh, about going? Like, what was, what was oh, yeah. you know, leading up to the trip, what, what were you most excited about? 
that's a great question. And, and maybe I'll fill in a little bit more background. So I went uh, in 2012, okay? And this is during a time when I was doing my PhD work, uh, which was not on meteorites. Um, it was a planetary science related project and it was studying an impact crater in Labrador. Um, but it wasn't, this program wasn't the main focus of my research. And so this was kind of like a side opportunity for me to go. Um, but again, at that point, I had done many seasons working in small camps, remote camps in, in places um, in the high Arctic. So uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is not a lie. One of the main things that motivated me, uh, <laughs> I'm going to bring the slide deck back up here. Um, here just, just wait a moment, okay? Well, I, I get through this. Um, I had this, uh, I have a fascination like all people maybe who, who work in remote environments of, um, you know, gear. I like gear. Uh, <laughs> and um, I had always been obsessed with Canada goose jackets. And I gotta tell you, this is before they were popular. Before they were a fashionable item, um, they were uh, something that were ju was just used in Arctic expeditions and Antarctic expeditions. So I'm just gonna flip through these slides to get to so uh, when you get when you're part of AMSMET, um, they issue you this kind of gear, you know, and it was one of the first things you do. This program actually you go to New Zealand. There's an, an American kind of um, uh, place there that houses all the equipment you get, and then they fly you down to Antarctica. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get my own Canada goose jacket. Look at it on the left hand side. I was so excited. And when <laughs> the day we went to get our gear, um, this is what it looked like. It was like a warehouse full of Canada goose jackets. <laughs> And I was losing my mind. <laughs> of course, I didn't get to keep it in the end, but it was just, to me, it was a symbol of Arctic and Antarctic exploration. And it was just kind of this moment of like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. So I was very excited about the jacket. <laughs> I can really um, that. Um, like when I, when I first went and worked up in Alaska, the, the getting geared up and getting your you know, we had to have like raincoats and rain boots and they were very specific and very special. And you felt like you were like joining a, a club or something, you know, getting to wear this gear. It was yeah, it was a bit of a badge of honor. Um, <laughs> and, and it meant a lot to me. So it sounds silly, but uh, they, you know, and I, I'm not sponsored by Canada Goose. <laughs> but that was, that was cool. Um, the other thing I mentioned earlier, this was this kind of like pull. Uh, like I actually, it's hard to describe this physical pull that I had to get to Antarctica. And I think it's after I'd done remote research in the, in the North that I was like, I just need to find a way there. And, and when you apply to this program, um, ANSMET, you write letters to the person in charge and it can take several years of kind of application or writing letters before you're selected to go. And so I did that for about three years. So it was kind of a long-term project. Yeah. Um, of waiting and finding the right timing. And then if it just happened that they were able to take a new recruit that year. So there was a lot of variables and, you know, good timing that came into play. Um, this, you know, uh, this is what really excited me, this idea of being in this remote environment and working in a, a small team. It's something that is really appealing to me. And that sounds very strange, but maybe we can untuck that in a little bit <laughs> that too i love it <laughs> and and in relation to my phd work i had mentioned i was working academically at this impact crater um, in labrador but part of that was using that situation in that crater as um as a comparison to the moon and we would also do these comparison or simulated studies uh for what it would be like to go explore in the moon and so this idea, we call this the analog missions, but basically simulated missions. And this idea of ANSMET as this kind of simulation of remote planetary exploration was also something that was really appealing to me. And a number of NASA astronauts have done ANSMET. And in fact, Don Petit, one of the astronauts, has basically said, if you've done ANSMET, you've done long duration space flight. And um, yeah, and, and we had a NASA astronaut on our team, Stan Love, and he basically said the same thing. He's like, you know, this living condition, this, it's just like being on station. I mean, there's, there's differences, but the, the kind of constraints that you have the, um, and, and associated risk. So that was, that was really um, oddly appealing to me. 
And, and in my research on those simulated missions, finding those comparisons that could be made to lunar exploration and then, of course, eventually uh, Mars exploration. And these, again, are some of the qualities that those remote environments have. You know, the moon, lunar exploration is harsh, it's isolated, it's dangerous, you live in a small quarters, you have limited communications. So mm -hmm. our communications in Antarctica with it by satellite phone um, which and, and we could upload small amounts of data and so we kind of had this blog um, that we could update but just like one or two photos uh, at a time so no live video feed or anything but we could we could use the sat phone to um, you know basically call them wow um, so I just I want to give a shout out to the people joining us so we have Matthew and Valerie Julie Dahlia Bettina and and also just to everyone else that's out there um, and remember, you can join this conversation in using the comments section. So please uh, feel free to join in. So you mentioned uh, the challenges of, of being in Antarctica, how they're similar to space missions. And wh what were you worried about going into this? Like, what were you most concerned about? Another good question. And my first answer might not be the obvious one that, uh, that people think about. Um, here, I'll put up a slide. I was uh, mostly worried. Um, here, I'll, I just want to flip forward a few slides here so you can see what I'm seeing. Um, oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, I was worried about the people aspect um, more than the physical danger. And, and I'll explain why. So the, um, there we go. Um, so our team was a team of eight people um, uh, from across academia. I, I mentioned there was a NASA astronaut. Uh, we have a mountaineer guide, uh, Sean, he's down at the bottom there. These are people I did not know before going on this mission. And in every field campaign I had done before, I, I knew my colleagues quite well and that the people dynamics and living in a remote environment is really important. So I was a little bit worried. And in this case, um, I was not gonna have my own tent. Um, so uh, and I- And to tell, but are you the only woman in that picture? So this is where I'm getting to. There's two women in that picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you live in a tent with two people. And so going into this campaign, uh, I was like, hmm, the chances of us, if, if there was a problem of being able to switch tents, was very low. <laughs> I hope this person is, you know, I hope they're cool. This is, this is our living conditions, you know? Um, so two people in a tent, they are your buddy. You sleep and you cook together. They are kind of your partner of crime. So we don't have group meals every day. It's you're, you're a unit, you're a two person unit. And so that relationship with that person is, is pretty important. And we were, out in the middle of nowhere for about six weeks. So that was probably my, uh, honestly, my number one concern, I would say. Um, just, uh, this is me looking across to what turned out to be an amazing tent mate. Like I hit the lottery. So my fears were totally unfounded in this case. Um, so Minnie's, a, she's the uh, actually director um, of planetary science at ASU now, at the time the director of meteoritics there incredible person. And she had actually done ANSMET 20 years previously when she was a grad student. <laughs> so she was an alumni, but from, from a, a while ago. So frequently these programs take, take people multiple, um, multiple times. So this was kind of basically the, the view of our tent. This is me, if I'm looking over, this is me looking to my feet. <laughs> and that is essentially the door kind of all scrunched up of, of your way out. So that was really my number one concern. Uh, I don't have an image. I would say the physical danger aspect, because I had heard some stories about crevasses mm -hmm. and people falling in crevasses. Um, uh, that was a concern that, you know, we mostly got around by snowmobile and uh, crevasses are something that can kind of be hidden by snow cover. And if there's a break, you know, there's a, there's a danger there. And, and so in our uh, training, when we first arrived at Antarctica, uh, we went to McMurdo Station and did some um, training there. And um, so we learned a little bit about like how, how you can rescue yourself and get out of crevasse. But that was kind of in the back of my mind. 
Right. Yeah. Preparation, you know, being prepared for something helps you yeah. less worried about it. Yeah. So I just want to say hi to Christina and Sophie. They're, they've joined us. And uh, also Carol from Whitefish, Ontario. <laughs> and <Hello>. uh, <laughs> we do have a question. So how do you shower in, in Antarctica? Or maybe like, how do you stay clean in Antarctica? Because I have a feeling maybe you don't shower. Is that yeah, that's a... <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I just kind of here. I'm gonna. So uh, I, I was gonna pull up a slide, but right now I've kind of lost have the, um, the meeting controls. Oh, there they are. Okay. Um, so we actually. So the tent I showed you that housed two people. There's another tent the same size that was kind of our. I guess you could say uh, washroom tent. Um, and and that would have our our toilet in there and it was a place you could go and also clean yourself now that tent did not have a heater um you could heat up water if you wanted and basically do like a sponge kind of shower and you know try to dip your head under water or something like that if you wanted but that was that was basically it uh when you're doing these kinds of camping it, it's really interesting in antarctica because it's so um there's no vegetation. There's essentially no germs. Um, and so uh, you're not as dirty as maybe other places where you're in Kielberg where you're in dirt. So that was kind of interesting. So anyway, bottom line, sponge bath, uh, you know, baby wipes, things like that. They all, they all work. And, and tell us more about, about what it was like there in Antarctica. Um, it was, it was incredible. Uh, I mean, the, the beauty of it, sometimes um, it, in this type of work, it was very, uh, I don't want to say scripted, but in a way, you knew what you're doing every day. You get up, you check the weather, you go and go meter hunting, and you could really get in the zone of doing that work. And I would actually constantly have to remind myself to, to look up and to like appreciate this landscape because it was unbelievable. It was, uh, it was so stunning. So, um, I really enjoy that kind of work where you just really get absorbed in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, but I really taking the time to appreciate the surroundings was uh, important. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. And oh, you got, you can go uh, full screen too on your pictures there so we can see the whole thing. Yeah, I'm just trying to sort of that, um, I'm just, I actually like to get out of, uh, I'm just going to get out of that mode because it's, um, it was just not sharing properly. Yeah. <laughs> we're all really uh, learning a lot about yeah. being remotely. And we're also, I think all of us are kind of having, you know, not as extreme an experience as you did of, of isolation, but we are experiencing this sort of being remote, not being able to see other people kind of being potentially stuck with, with one group of people, with our immediate family and having to you know, to really get along and sort things out and have yeah. a, an expeditionary kind of mentality. Yeah. Um, and what were some of the, the strategies you had for, for dealing with that isolation? Like you got lucky, you had a great tent mate. Yeah. Um, what else, what else did you do? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. And I've been thinking about that a lot, obviously during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And when I come back to it, I think before going to the campaign, I was concerned about, oh my goodness, I'm going to really have to take care of myself, like making sure I'm getting enough sleep and, you know, because I don't want to be a burden on the team. And I was um, kind of thinking about that stuff. And then as we were there, in fact, we had some pre-training um, around the focusing on team. And I think this is what really made the difference in isolation because you don't operate as a single person. You, you thrive and you um, don't thrive as, as a team. And so the mentality there was always helping um, in any way you could. It didn't matter if you got your tent down first before someone else, because we all have to get our tents down, right? Mm -hmm. And so that you'd mentioned expedi expedition uh, behavior and team dynamics, and that's a big part of it is um, it's not competitive. You're in this, how do we help each other all the time? Um, and in this isolated environment, I, I actually, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, great. And let me know if it's in full screen. Okay. So we can, um, 
make sure I have that right. Beautiful. Great. So this is a, an image of our full team. Uh, this is during one of our kind of uh, lunchtime breaks, actually, out in the field one day. Um, and I think it's a good reflection of our relationship with each other here is pretty casual and just kind of like hanging out. Um, and as as the course of the season went on, uh, it was really hard in camp to all meet together because the size of the tents were so small. Um, so, oh, I think they're, sorry, this is a really fun shot. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and, and so eventually partway through the season, it might have not even have been until after Christmas, so we were there December, January, um, that we kind of had this spare tent, which is our gear tent, um, and where we would store and package up the samples we collected. And uh, we collectively also called it our party tent. And, um, and for special occasions like Christmas or, or a, a big kind of group meal, we would all gather in this tent. And it, it was really squishy, or maybe we'd play games. But the importance of that gathering became more and more apparent as the season went on. So that connection to each other. So during the season, we would often, you know, in pairs, you, you'd go visit another tent and maybe you'd play, a, you know, crib or something amongst four of you. That was the most comfortable arrangement. <laughs> um, but remembering those social elements in isolation, they're not a, a good to have. They were a must have. And I think right now, while we're all isolated in our family situations and, uh, you know, I'm working like like many folks out there, it's it's um, and we're trying to get stuff done. Sometimes it's hard to focus on how are we helping each other or like what are the family things we're doing and prioritizing that in the same way, because that is that is how we're going to stay healthy in this and, and stay connected. And so that was as I was thinking about this presentation, that kind of lesson became very clear. <laughs> especially as I was looking through all the photos oh well, that's a really good message yeah to take time to to have fun together and to be social and play games and another thing that you said that that really seems important is is getting enough sleep right for me um you know when I've been on expeditions or preparing for for an assessment or something like that it becomes really uh, critical to, to get enough sleep. And I realized that's like the foundation of, of everything is, is that regular good uh, sleep hygiene really, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We actually have a question from a viewer from Bettina and she's asking, she's you know saying, okay, we're there in the summer, right? Yeah, so this is the Antarctic summer, which is North America's winter, yeah. Right, and the sun wasn't setting, so. Yep. How did that affect you? Like, how did that affect your sleep to not have dark? Yeah, that's a good question. So it was absolute 24 hour daylight. Um, the sun would kind of move around um, and, and never set. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I had been in that situation before uh, doing field work in the Canadian high Arctic. So that wasn't new to me. Um, and I actually didn't find that aspect particularly challenging. Of course, you can always wear like a, a mask. You have a mask. Do you uh, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I, I may have had. <clears throat> I'll, I'll also give you a sense of what it was like to sleep in Antarctica. So, um, <laughs> uh, as I showed earlier in our tent, we have our cooking stove, which is in a propane. Mm -hmm. so we were sitting in there and awake. We could have that stove on, and it could actually be quite warm in the tent at the kind of ground level, and it would be quite warm at, at the top. In the evening, obviously, we turned off the propane stove, and um, and the temperatures would drop. Uh, so we would be, I would be fully like clothed in fleece, you know, clothing, um, as well as uh, a fleece liner, as well as a down sleeping bag, as well as a hat, a, you know, a hood. <laughs> yeah, all of that. So it was pretty. <laughs> you're in a cocoon. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I will say about sleep. And there may be people experiencing this um, nowadays. Uh, we had days, we had um, not a lot, thankfully, but a number of like weather days where if it's too windy, we can't go out collecting meters and you're basically 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, towards the end of the season, we had a few of those in a row, like say maybe two days in a row. And I would find that after two days, like you're in, you're reading books. Um, you know, we, we did have generators, so you could maybe watch a movie or something, but being in this cozy cocoon, 
it would be very comfortable. You would read your book, read kind of doze, and you know, make some nice food, and you would get very lethargic. Mm. You know, it was just very. It was. It wasn't difficult. It was just very lethargic. And then getting out of that mode into work structured mode was kind of. Uh, I I found that a bit jarring, um, and I could see, I could see situations now where people at home are getting. You know, I think now lots of people are getting into routines, but establishing. I'm sure people have heard this a lot. Establishing a routine for your day um, can help counter that. Uh, that effect basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have a question from Sophie uh, she's in Ottawa okay. and she'd like to know why people don't live in Antarctica I mean I even get people coming into the science center doubting that Antarctica even exists <laughs> that happens yeah Not it people get to see it right um, yeah it, it is yeah, so the um, the only people who live in Antarctica are at research stations. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, you know, really been in the last hundred years, I would say that there's kind of this established human presence where buildings have been built. There are a number of research stations that house people all year round. So in effect, people do live in Antarctica. Um, so I, again, I was operating through the U.S. Antarctic program, and their main research station is called McMurdo, the McMurdo base, and it's actually pretty large. Um, I could flip through and find a photo if you want. It's like a, a small little town. Um, mm -hmm. I know I've I, seen some photos. My friend that uh, John was stationed there for a little while. Yeah, and it yeah. and I um, I thought it was. I don't know if I had seen photos before I went. I, I thought it would be a lot smaller than it was. Like there was a cafe. And they even have a, a greenhouse, right? Like, well, not, not like a glass. No, there's a, like there's a research yeah. laboratories. There are yeah. research laboratories. There's a full on cafeteria. There's residential um, do um, dorms. Uh, like there's, they have a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's kind of like the International Space Station, right? It's like it's one of those um, outposts that's on the very edge of, of where humans can exist. Yeah, oh, that, yeah. that's a really cool So picture. this is just kind of a, a pano shot of the whole town, so to speak. And I think there's about 2,000 people there in the, in the Antarctic summer months. And, down, and then in the winter, it scales down to a skeleton crew of, I think, about 200 who are essentially maintaining the station. So there's not as much scientific studies that are happening. It's, it's a lot about maintenance. Hmm. Um, and I always find the social dynamic studies of the folks who winter over to be really fascinating because they are truly isolated in a way that the summer campaigns uh, are not. Um, but there were, we were in McMurdo a little bit longer than we thought we would just with delays and getting out to the field. Mm -hmm. And so again, I remember doing like some yoga classes and going to the cafe and there's a real social environment <laughs> <laughs> um, to the community. It, was, it really felt like a community. That's really neat. Well, let's, let's bring it back to the science because um, you were there, you know, to have an adventure um, and to satisfy your, your curiosity about Antarctica, um, but also to do some science. And we actually have a question um, from a viewer. Did you find any uh, special meteorite while you were there? And, oh, and, uh, like what? What your findings were. That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to pull up some slides because, uh, uh, we, we got really lucky <laughs> and finding good stuff. Um, I'll show you this first slide, uh, which is, um, basically the first meteorite I found, which arguably, <laughs> it was very tiny. This maybe was not so special. So not all meteorites are created equal. Um, there's some meteorite types that, uh, out of that 40,000 globally, we have a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. and there's other meteorites that we don't. Um, I'm going to show, uh, hopefully some other slides in here. Our season, uh, when, when you're meteorite hunting, you're not classifying the meteorites as you collect them. Our job is simply to collect them. And then they're sent back uh, to NASA in Houston, and then eventually to the Smithsonian. And that's when the classification happens. So, and that could be a year or two after the fact. During our season, um, we actually found a lot of incredibly large samples. This is astronaut Stan Loves, the first meteorite he found, uh, for example. 
Um, we did collect a grand total of 330 meteorites, uh, which I would say is average for this campaign. Sometimes they collect up to a thousand and sometimes, you know, maybe it's only 150 for a season, but every season they collect something. Um, this is just to get a sense of what does a meteorite look like? I haven't answered your question yet. I'm going to because it's pretty cool. Uh, and then our season, we found a, a fair amount of very large samples and that's unusual. So that previous one, maybe like a fifth size sample is, is more common and, and smaller. We found a fair number of large ones, and it turns out three of the samples we found are from Mars. Wow. And I will tell you, that is the holy grail of meteorite hunting. So in terms of where meteorites come from, many of them are basically from the asteroid belt and found their way to Earth. Uh, and there's very few of them that are from the moon or from Mars, like maybe only a hundred different meteorites from Mars have been have been found and they're kind of broken into different pieces. So not a lot. And for Mars, those are the only samples we have. We have never done a sample return mission from Mars. So finding a Martian meteorite is incredible. Finding a lunar meteorite is also amazing. We also have samples from the moon from the Apollo program. Of course, they sampled one particular area um, that we could see of the moon and lunar meteorites may come from all over. So Anyway, that was a very exciting find uh, for our season. How do you, how do you know where, <clears throat> this, is, this is coming from a, sure. from a viewer, um, how, how do you know where a meteorite has come from? Like how, do, how do scientists determine that? That's a, really, that's a very good question. And there's, there's a couple of clues. One is um, what it looks like, and then basically what it's made of and its chemistry. Uh, people often ask, like, how do you know it's from Mars? Um, because, or because you can think planetary bodies, they're more similar actually to Earth in some ways. The rocks on Mars, if, if anyone has stuff about Mars, it, there's volcanoes, right? We have volcanoes on Earth. Um, and so it might be tricky to figure out how is something different than a rock on Earth. And what's really interesting is in early uh, Mars missions, some of the um, early landers studied the atmosphere of of Mars. So really early like in the 70s, we knew what the atmospheric composition of Mars. And what's really interesting is when people first found these meteorites, they're like, oh, what? This is weird. What, where is this from? You know? And when you're looking, when you, they were able to look at it close up, they found trapped bubbles of air. And that could be analyzed. And then the direct comparison of like, oh my gosh, that composition of that air is the same as the Martian atmosphere. And then the connection was made. From that, they've been able to kind of create deeper clues because with that first one they could say oh well you know this general composition and, and things like that we know it's from mars but that was kind of a, an interesting first clue there's other uh, meteorites from um like the asteroid belt and asteroids that have interesting textures that are only in meteorites and they're made of these kind of spheres small, small spheres called spherules or chondrites a uh, chondrules sorry and so some for the texture of the rock can also give hints as to where, where it comes from. Very cool science. So you are, oh, okay, we have another question from Bettina. <laughs> she wants to know if you were able to keep a sample as a souvenir. No, oh. no. <laughs> so you're like banned from Antarctica for life. <laughs> um, okay. So no, so we couldn't keep any of uh, the meteorites ourselves. They they are collected for science, and um, that's very strict. And they're again the process is they're packaged on ice, they're shipped back, um, I think via boat uh, to the states. They're, they go to NASA in Houston, and they have a whole life there and categorized, and then eventually long term storage at the Smithsonian in Washington D.C. Um, what I did keep, though, is I did I was able to collect non meteorite rocks. Um, so I did collect a whole bunch of meteor wrong. <laughs> so as we were searching, we were often searching in areas where there were lots of other black rocks that could fool you um, uh, that were not meteorites. And so I have I kind of collected a kit because it's a really great activity to do with folks is to figure out which one's the real meteorite, and which one's the wrong one. Um, and then as a geologist, there was a lot of other kind of just fascinating um, samples that were okay to collect. You know, there's some fossils, there's, um, yeah, just some neat rocks. Very cool. 
Okay, I have one last. Uh, oh, <laughs> Emmett actually is, has, he wants to know if uh, meteorites are white when they are in outer space. Oh, that's a really interesting question. So um, the composition of meteorites, uh, they would not be white, even on the inside, most of them. Um, the strangest ones may be a gray or dark gray, say so like a moon rock or something. The ones that are from asteroids tend to be high in um, uh, metal, so they have a high iron content, which makes the, dark, the rock really dark. The reason when we find meteorites on Earth that they have, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna flip back to that um, image of a meteorite. Are you, able, are you able to see that now, Aletha? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so you can see there's a crust, that dark crust on the outside of the rock. It looks like a gobstopper kind of effect. Mm -hmm. That outer crust is, is dark and that's called a fusion crust. And when a meteorite comes through Earth's atmosphere, the outer part of it actually melts. And, um, and so that's why meteorites have this dark uh, surface to them, which is really characteristic of, of meteorites. But when you look on the inside, they can be different colors, but none of them are white, purely white. That, it depends on the, what the rock is made up of, the kinds of uh, minerals, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't find just pure white minerals that make up uh, um, unlike on earth right because i think the most common one on earth is quartz which is white. exactly exactly. One, yeah. exactly so at the beginning you said that um 70 of all meteorites are found in antarctica and carly would like to know why why are there so many meteorites? oh i was really hoping someone would ask this okay okay <laughs> i'm gonna have to um definitely flip to some slides here because it's such a cool story I don't know how much time I have, but I love this. I love this question. <laughs> we're over time, but we're still getting questions. So let's keep going. Okay. Okay. I, I will, uh, I will, uh, it's, it's just so cool. Anyway. Um, okay. Let's see what pops up here. Okay. So why are there so many uh, meters in there? And I hope people at home have been thinking about what their answer would be. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're seeing any comments in the, in the comments, but feel free to like shout out people's guesses. I can certainly tell you what the common responses that I've heard is are. Okay. Have you seen any there? I haven't seen any guesses yet. Okay. So right now you're looking at Antarctica. It's white. Uh, and so one of the main things is it's easy to find stuff. It's easy to find dark rocks on a white surface. True. Um, another reason people think of is um, maybe that's something to do with gravity or there's like more meteors somehow attracted to Antarctica. That is not true. Meteorites can fall anywhere on earth. There's no, there's no preference as to where they fall. So it's, it's really a matter of um, where, where we find them. And out of the, all of the other ones that are not found in Antarctica, most of those are actually found in desert environments. So again, it's easier to find kind of rocks in these barren uh, places. So the interesting thing about Antarctica is this is actually a diagram. This is a science-y slide, but it's showing movement. These lines are showing the movement of ice away from the South Pole towards the edges of Antarctica. So the ice in Antarctica is moving. So as meteorites over tens of thousands of years are falling onto the surface of Antarctica, they're getting moved along. You know, maybe they'll get incorporated into the ice a bit, but they're getting, kind of getting moved along in this conveyor belt of ice. That's moving. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Look, zoom in on this area. So again, these lines are moving kind of from the um, top right down towards the shore. That's the movement of the ice. And right in the way is a mountain chain. So you're getting this ice moving away mm -hmm. and it hits up against this mountain chain and oop, it stops. So it like collects meteorites. Yeah, so, but there's another piece to it. So it's moved all, it's like the conveyor belt of meteorites has moved along, it hits the mountain range and boom, it stops. And then you get this like intense uh, wind um, that, that moves along, it's like a wind tunnel along this um, mountain chain. Uh, this is just a little bit of a bird's eye view of where we were located. We, are, we were about 500 kilometers away from the South Pole and kind of obviously inland from the shore. 
Um, so as the stuff's collected, it's incorporated, it gets to, it ramps up against the mountain range, and then the wind will um, basically ablate or erode the ice, exposing whatever rock was entrenched within that ice. And so at the base of this uh, Antarctic mountain range, uh, you're getting all of these meteorites that have been collected. It's amazing. That is amazing. Wow, thank you. Yeah, and, and okay. the way, and the, the, what they look for when they're choosing sites to go to are these blue patches of ice. Um, because of course the, the stuff is exposed. We actually also did a lot of meteorite hunting in moraines. So moraines, glacial moraines are like when ice has moved and kind of dropped all the rocks that are within it. And as a result, you get this pile of exposed like rocks, like this size, small size, but not just meteorites. Like there was a ton of other rocks. So th that kind of searching is definitely more tedious. You were using our eyesight to, to find these meteorites and it's really kind of walking along and just looking down and, and trying to spot them. Well, we are still getting questions. Um, we don't have time to answer all of them, um, but we will address them later in the comments, even though we can't uh, do it. During the <laughs> and thank you everyone for, for participating and for asking so many questions. I do have I do have one last question of my own. So oh, you sure. are now the executive director of the Canadian Association of Science Centers, which Science North is a member of. Um, and I'm I'm just curious why it's important to you that Canada has science centers. Oh, I love this question. Um, I, yeah, I could probably talk for a whole other half hour on this topic. <laughs> uh, for me, the um, access to science. Uh, to scientists is is critical. So I, I, you know, I come from a research science background and also, um, you know, an education uh, background and engagement with, with youth and kids. And um, science centers are places where people go uh, to learn about the world and to have access and to get their questions answered, have access to science. So they are the number one trusted place that people turn to to get information on science. Um, they're basically tied with universities. Universities aren't as accessible to the public. You know, you don't just kind of walk up and knock on the door and be like, hey, I've got this science question. <laughs> uh, but as science centers, you can go there. Uh, the people who work there, the science communicators, have backgrounds, are trained scientists themselves. Like they look at you, you know, you have a, a PhD as well, right? Um, so for me, it's this place that's accessible uh, where science is, um, it, it's relevant to people's lives. So often the direct connection to, to someone's life or for school kids, it could be a direct connection to what they're doing in school and what they're learning. Mm -hmm. And the approach is really open-ended and curiosity driven. And I think that's critical and for all ages to maintain curiosity. It's, it's an essential ingredient to critical thinking to so many things. So to me, that's what science centers foster. And that's really their need, I would say, um, everywhere. I mean, not just in Canada. I think they're important anchor institutions around the globe. That's my short answer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne, for sharing your Antarctica experience with us and, and really your passion for cultivating, you know, a culture of, of science and innovation in Canada. Um, so for those of you watching, you can follow Marianne on Twitter at Marian Mater, or you can connect with her on LinkedIn. And I just wanna thank everyone again for particip participating in this Blue Coat Talk. Bye for now. Thanks everybody.